and processes portion of the class, our foundations and vocabularies. And this episode is coming um, off of our discussion of two-dimensional art, so drawing and painting. And when we when we move to the third the third dimension, the 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 type, the category of art that we most associate with that is sculpture. Right, and so uh, uh, the goal of this of this episode is is to give you a taste. Right, I, I could go on and on and on about sculpture. This is actually sculpture is the me the the material and the process that I study the most. Uh, I really like that it's very interactive. You can actually sense sculpture because it's in your space. It's three dimensional. You can walk around it. You can inter it interacts with your environment. You interact with its environment, etc. Right. Um, so I could go on and on, but I'm just going to give us this, uh, a, a, you know, a fairly brief overview with definitions and keywords of the different types of sculpture. But sculpture is a very amorphous um, <laughs> type of art. Of, of of three-dimensional art it can it can take many many different forms and because lines are always blurred uh, some sculpture really blurs the line between painting and, and other types of, of processes but let's uh, begin the objectives. What what will you all be able to do by the end of this episode? Well, you'll be able to identify the different approaches to making sculpture that artists choose. Some of them are very traditional because sculpture has been around for a very long time. So it does have a, a tradition in that sense. But also we have artists that break away at, at, at tradition. And this is the type that I actually really like. I love artists messing with um, the way things, you know, have been done before. Then next, you'll be able to describe how the medium affects the overall look and feel of the sculpture, right? So not, it, not all sculpture looks the same, just like not all drawing and painting looks the same, but you can really play with human perception because you are in our space. We have to interact with it on in a very direct level. And so you can really mess with uh, how we experience this particular um, art form. And then we're actually going to think about how sculpture interacts with us. Not only our vision, but our actual body, our sensations, how, how we actually sense versus just what we see um, in our environment. And that is the really fascinating thing about sculpture is that it impacts us on multiple levels, right? Not just our eyes, but also with our body and and our, our, our and in, in a lot of ways, our emotions um, and our psychology. So let's get started. So definitions, let's, so three-dimensional art sculpture. And I mentioned it's very, very old, just like painting, like cave paintings that I showed um, in a previous ev episode, as soon as humans saw clay, you know, and they, they the clay on, on the riverbeds and they harvested clay and they figured out that you can mold it, you can dry it, you can fire it, um, you can melt down metal you and, and, and sculpt that in certain ways, right? As soon as that technology was developed, which happened very early on in human development all over the globe, we had sculpture. And so I love this wonderful, cute little bull <laughs> um, that I gave you from the Min Minoan culture uh, from um, in Crete, which is uh, Gre Greece's largest island to the south in um, the, and and so we have this wonderful bulls and, and this culture, they really liked bulls. That's probably something, if you've heard of the Minoan culture that they, they liked bulls, it was a very sacred animal to them. And it was also a very favorite uh, representation. And so here we have a, a vase. Um, and so when you, when you see the word vase next to something that's ancient, fairly ancient, I mean, this is from the, you know, 1400 before the current era, so very, very long ago, very ancient. When you see the word vase, it's not a vase as in we put flowers in it, as what we would normally think of it. This is actually a, a vessel for liquid in it, and it's meant to be poured. So you can kind of see it from this view. We have uh, the, uh, the hole on the top of the head where you, know, you can put the liquid, and then you have this cute little hole right here is where the liquid would come out. And they had various uses, functional, also ritualistic, um, a lot of different functions. But you can see that with sculpture, it's not just a functional object, 
right? It, it is in some way, but you can really make it something else, right? You can, you can, and that, and the meaning behind the representation of, on the outside is infusing with its, with its function in many ways. And so we have this wonderfully articulated and expressive bowl um, that has been made into this face and uh, glazed in a way that uh, makes me think it's very, very cute. I hope you also think it's very cute. But as you can see, just from me explaining this, this object, that sculpture captures a great many types of techniques, media, and purposes. So there's elements of painting, there's um, there's there's technology, engineering, planning. How do you fire it? How, what is the process, right? There's there's drawing in it as well. So it it, do, it does capture a lot. But if we're thinking about just basic definitions, sculpture has to exist in three dimensions, right? It has to have length, width, volume. Right, and it has to exist in our physical space, in our in our in our world. Right, you could say yes, a painting and a drawing exists in our world. They're not, you know, they're not phantoms. They're not ghosts. Um, but thinking about sculpture, that it, it it interacts with our our actual physical environment. So, for instance, this vase. You, you you hold it and then when you're not using it you usually put it somewhere it, be it you know a cupboard or somewhere else right or if you're thinking about a sculpture that you've seen outside it's actually blocking your way you can't walk through you have you're forced to walk around it right and that's what i mean by it, it occupies actual physical human space um, unlike you know paintings they, they usually are on walls you know we're not you know we're not necessarily like stepping through them and so sculpture really interacts with us. It's in our setting, it's in our environment. That's what makes it so powerful and so interesting for me. And hopefully you can hear how excited I'm getting because I study a, a lot of sculpture um, and it, appe it appeals to our senses. It, it, you can put sounds in sculpture. You can, you can make emotion activated. There's a lot of artists that use a lot of tech behind their sculptures to really interact. You could use textures to make us want to touch it, right? With the, you know, and, and other and other experiential sensations and, and and it hits you like pretty pretty hard and that's what I love I love about um, this 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 type of work and so now we're gonna go through a very a very um, very itemized so very uh, fluid um, hopefully the different approaches to three dimensions and since we're coming out of the two-dimensional I thought it would be good to show you where where does the two-dimensional end and the three dimensions start? And this is a very blurry line, right? Because um, I love to show you that you know these definitions aren't hard and fast. There's always something there that you know that really makes us makes these definitions pretty loose. And so we're going to talk about relief sculpture to begin. And why we're talking about relief sculpture sculpture is because like painting and drawing it usually is on a flat surface right so typically a wall or um a, you know really you can make relief sculptures um on on like a slab that you can then stick on a wall and so there are two types of of relief sculptures uh the one that you're looking at now is called base relief which base means french for low so low relief so it's either base relief or low relief you can refer to it either way it means the same thing and so what this means it is sculpt it is sculpting and we'll get into the different methods of sculpting but to sculpt right in, in this case you're actually taking that that wonderful stone right this limestone which is a pretty soft stone and very easy to to actually you know you know carve and so that's what we're seeing we're carving into this this the stone wall to create an image and so we're and and to do this and this and this I know this is a very sad image um a very ancient image from um it's Assyrian from 650 before the current era and it's a dying lioness so we see this this really expressive and detailed lion with all of these you know spears and arrows in in her body and you can see she's struggling um, to get away so it is a very dramatic and sad scene but I I, I think it's a really great example of um, showing how uh, how with this low relief you can create some sense of depth 
right? That they're, you know, especially looking at these legs, that one leg is actually in front of the other, right? Um, which is actually really hard to do in a, a, on this 2D, on, on this two-dimensional flat surface. But, but you can, right? You can really play with the muscles and, um, you know, layering. Um, and why it's low relief is because it's very shallow, right? Um, where, where we don't get, we get a sense of space of, of the three-dimensional space that this dying lioness is existing in, but it, it's, it's very, it seems very flat, right? You know, this, the, her legs just kind of look like splayed in, in this triangle motion. Um, and we can't actually like look it, it, around her, her feet, right? We all, we only have this very, uh, shallow look. And that has everything to do with the fact that low relief is exactly what it means. It's carving that doesn't go deep into it. Um, and, and, and relief is always, it's not freestanding, right? So this is sculpture that exists on walls. We can't walk around it. And so like painting, like drawing, these, the, the illusion of depth has everything to do with uh, how, how far you carve and what you do with that surface. And so the opposite of uh, low relief is high relief and that and and hopefully you, you get a sense of what that means that means that the sculptor's marks are deep very very deep we're still working on a two-dimensional surface like so here we have a cast um uh from uh, a cast bro uh, bronze right so it, 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 we have these wonderful horses that are jumping leaping out of something that is put on the wall just like a painting or you, you know displaying a drawing right um but notice the sculptor has made varying depths right varying depths to create a greater sense of that that three-dimensional illusion right look i mean and i love this detail that's so deep that this the feet right of this horse are actually coming out of the frame almost like it is jumping into our space we're looking at it and something 2d is becoming something almost 3d and high relief has that ability to really blend the two-dimensional world with the three-dimensional world because of these deep very variations in depth and you can create you know different details right notice how very detailed in the faces but then the main kind of blends in you can you can very detail depth to create um, a very realistic type uh, of space within the image but still like low relief this is not freestanding even though you know you could uh, you could take your little hand and kind of put it behind the the horse's front legs it, you still can't you cannot walk around the entire work and so low relief high relief right really blending the two dimensions into the, into the three dimensions. So hopefully it's very clear to you if, if you know if I showed you an image, you know, okay, to your best guess based upon what we've talked about, is it high relief? Is, is it low relief? And so, so clearly you can see, you know, very shallow marks versus very deep marks. But then we have freestanding sculpture, the opposite of relief. And this means you can walk around it. And I love this example, Laocoon and his sons from 200 BCE. So this is an example from uh, a period in ancient Greece in the, called the Hellenistic period. Um, a period of time that occurred uh, after the death of Alexander the Great, if you've heard of, of, of him. And so the freestanding, it means sculpture that can be experienced in 360 degrees, but it may not be intended to be experienced this way. And that's important. You, you can walk around it, but artists, some artists maybe don't, it's not necessary to see all angles and all views for what it, what the narrative what the what the representation is trying to do and this is why this example is so good because it is meant really to be looked at frontally to see Laocoon try to save his sons from this serpent beast that was sent to kill them right and so you in and emphasizing this is that the snake right here is really weaving through all of these figures and they're touching them in different ways and it's really leading us frontally through this this image right so that we 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 see that the snake is biting like when we see him grasping it we see his, his face and we see all of uh, all of their emotions this is really only something that you can see uh, right here so this image is is is, is us 
in the, the in Vatican City in the Vatican Museum looking at it. And look, it, it's even cor corded off. So you yourself could, you know, step over and, and walk around it, but it, it, you don't need to, right? Well, what would you see? You would see just you, the back of their bodies and you wouldn't actually get the pain, the expressiveness, the emotion and the intensity of, of what um, the sculptor wanted us to, to think about in relation to these figures and the narrative and the mythology that they're part of, right? So great example of something that is 3D, but it's, it's not necessarily intended to be experienced in 360 degrees. So here's another view of, of slightly um, off center, so off the frontal, and you can kind of see that actually you're missing a lot of the information um, by the more, the more uh, around the work you're getting. You're not getting any of the facial expressions at all. So now we're going to move on to methods of sculpture, right? So one, I'm just going to reiterate, just so it exists in three dimensions. It, 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 it's experienced in 360 degrees, but not necessarily intended to. Um, and this is another great example of something that could, could be experienced in 360, but not because that a part of the back, right? The back of the actual sculpture is to a wall and you're really just meant to see what is on the outside, but you could easily pull it out from the wall and walk around it. And this is Louise Nevelson's Royal Tide 2. And this is an example of our first method of sculpture carving, right? And so she's carving wood that she then paints. Um, and so in thinking about methods of sculpture, the, they're either something that we call subtractive or additive, right? You're either taking the material away from something or you're adding it. And just thinking about carving and carving wood, what do you think it is? Is it subtractive? Taking, are you taking it away to make your, make your image or are you adding something? So hopefully you all say subtractive and that and carving tends to do that you're you're it's whatever what, whatever it is it could be stone it could here it's wood um that's how you're making it and so you're really dealing with taking away negative space you're thinking you're thinking about okay so she's thinking about making all of this really interesting kind of machinery you know we're, we're it's almost like we're, we, we've we've unlocked uh, a look into a, a a watch or an elevator or some of some sort of me mechanical device and maybe even a computer um and and so she when she was thinking about this she, was, she knew the the shape she wanted to basically unlock or release from from the wood and so she is carving out um, the negative space around the object to create this positive image. And so that's one, one method um, of carving. You can also model. So modeling, right, is, is different from, from carving. And uh, I think clay and working with ceramics is a really great example of modeling. So it's usually a soft material like clay or wax. You could, it could be something else as well or molded into a sculptural form, right? So this is a, a wonderful example, uh, ancient example of a sarcophagus. So something that would housed a, 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 a dead body that had been prepared for burial. And this is from uh, the Etruscan culture uh, ancient culture that, that lived in the Italian peninsula, so in Italy, uh, before, you know, the Greeks came and the Romans came. Um, and, and so very old ancient culture um, endemic to, to and so I feel like in the mid of Italy to the north of Italy. And so they loved clay. They loved especially terracotta, which is uh, clay that is, has this wonderful red color. You're probably familiar with terracotta. It's very popular for, you know, getting it getting it at the hardware store for your for your plants, right? And um, they use they they molded it into into different shapes. So here's a sarcophagus, and so you have the, the the space where the body would be, but then you also have this wonderful uh, figuration on on top, right? You have actually this is these are the two people be who are buried, um, and th and this is interesting just to know about the Etruscans. They bury if you were a couple, you were buried together, and they had this scene as if you were still alive on top 
talking, hanging out, maybe you're at a party um, and they were really in interested in, in, in death as something that is very much like life itself, that you would do the same things um, and have that, that same relationship um, with, with the world in the afterlife. But you can see too, this is actually a huge uh, uh, um, clay sculpture. And because of that, it, it, it's actually made in different sections and parts, right? And so it has to be molded, right? So if we're thinking about subtractive and additive, something like modeling is additive. You're, you're adding things, you're sticking things um, on, on different things. So you're not taking away like carving wood. And then we have casting. Casting usually involves pouring a liquid or pliable material into a mold. So very famously, you know, casting, you use liquid metal. So bronze is very popular throughout uh, the ages. And here we have a very famous bronze from ancient Greece. And this is the Artemisian bronze. The scholars are you know they they argue with each other of whether or not this is a representation of Poseidon the sea god or of Zeus the the sky god uh we don't have what he's throwing if he, if it was a trident it would probably be Poseidon if it was a thunderbolt it would be uh Zeus if you know your your Greek mythology but this is an example of of cast bronze and in the ancient in ancient Greece they they this was their preferred method of of sculpture and so it, the, the, it, 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 invi it, it involves a technique right so you have to first think of uh, so casting you're pouring it around a, a, a model of the final work right so the artist had to create um, something that looked exactly like this from an, an, another material right and then uh, a mold is then made around that that original model and then you pour your liquid metal and it kind of sandwiches between the two right and so you have a you have that that it, that outline basically the liquid is kind of forming to to the mold um, and the outside so very laborious and um, this is called uh, especially with thinking about ancient Greece a lost cast technique we don't know exactly how they did it, but we can surmise how, how they did it because, and we actually don't have a lot of examples of cast bronze from ancient Greece. That's why this is so famous because it was found um, in the sea. It was an, a shipwreck. Um, and we don't have a lot of these bronzes because um, the, a lot of the, the Greek bronzes were melted down in later centuries to, to create other, other things. But this is another example of an additive type of, of sculpture, right? You're not carving. It's very much like, like the modeling, right? You're, you're, you're adding it to, to something else. And then we have the, the, this section. So the, the first section, so we have the, the sculpture, the carving, the modeling, the casting. These are, those are all very traditional types of sculpture. That's why a lot of the ones I gave you were from the ancient world. Um, just very, very old techniques. But now we're gonna think about other techniques of sculpture that are non-traditional, that they go beyond the traditional methods. And so a lot of these examples are gonna be modern to contemporary because uh, specifically during that era, artists were interested in breaking down these boundaries and really playing with what could be sculpture. And I start with this, I start with assemblage because this is another one that really bl blends the, the boundary between well, what, is, what is sculpture and what is painting and what is drawing and what is relief, right? It really, really messes with our, our sense. And so assemblage is the base definition is when you gather different types of objects, which could be anything, it could be anything in the world, it could be trash, it could be buttons, it could be uh, parachutes, right, which is this is a small parachute, anything, and fabricating them to into a work of art. It, it's almost like collage. If any of you have done collage or, or anything like that, it's very much like that. And, and of course, this is this is an additive, right? So it's additive. Um, you're adding things to to a surface. And so this is Robert Rauschenberg Charlene from 1954. Rauschenberg, pretty well-known um, American modern artist. And so he is creating this very textured and layered surface. He's using found objects, but he's also painting, right? He's painting different colors, giving different textures, right? And this is this is a method of sculpture that um, is is very much about 
objects, right? Um, people who work with assemblage are very interested in in the kind of layering that you get from a trash heap, right? When you when you see a trash heap, you see a bunch of objects kind of mixed together and layered, and you see all the different materials and working together, and it creates its own aesthetic. Um, that type of, of accumulation uh, of of actual materials, and so uh, someone like Rauschenberg was very interested in that as a representation of, of of city life, right? That something like this is easily something that if you, you live in a highly urban environment, which he did in New York City, you see trash, you see all bits, you see you know paint from work people and buildings all melding together. And so he he saw it as very much a representation of New York City as 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 a city that was changing a lot during the fifties. So that's assemblage. And then we have ready-mades, which we'll focus a lot more closely on ready-mades later on um, in this course. But just briefly, these are artworks that just use raw materials that already exist, sometimes just literally a, an object that you, fi you find. And, and they become the work in and of itself. And so this is a very famous example by Marcel Duchamp called Fountain from 1917, where he literally just found a urinal uh, turned it, it turned it on its side, and he signed it R. Mutt, 1917, and R. Mutt was one of his aliases that he he liked to use. And so ready-mades are very much about making us think about, well, what is an art object to begin with? Because we usually think of it as something that is made by an artist, right, or a maker, or an artisan, right? Uh, Marcel Duchamp did not make this urinal, he just found it, and he man manipulated it, and he signed it. And so really making us rethink about, well, well, what is an art object? But like I said, we'll get into this a little bit more, especially that the, the philosophy behind that, like I just said, like, what is art? Um, could it be something like this? And then we have construction. And these sculptures forgo all traditional methods of carving, casting. Instead, they create works using factory methods. So engineering, a lot of technology, um, a lot of scientific know-how to, to think about this. So Damien Hirst, contemporary artist, very uh, well known for these types of constructions within galleries. And uh, a lot of them are very, kind of strange. Um, they, they make us think about um, certain things. They're, they seem kind of impossible. And so this is the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. And so he was very in interested in these conceptual ideas and making us feel something, right? Feel confusion or feel like unease around his, around his works. And so here we have this tiger shark, a real tiger shark, um, no longer alive, obviously, suspended in formaldehyde solution and encased in glass and steel. And so for something like this, he, the artist, can't, you know, he's thinking about the idea of the construction, but it, he needs... Um, engineers. He needs other people who 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 can you know can can do this for him, and as well as sourcing formaldehyde and figuring out how to how to do that. Um, and so, but 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 you know, creating this this impossibility that when you see it in the gallery, you are kind of amazed and you're thinking about, well, it looks so alive, but it's dead, and it's it's very much about Dam Damien Hirst wanting us to to sense something and feel things. This is also a good uh, sculpture to talk about how. Uh, something like this can actually affect us on not just a visual level, but a real physical level. And so this artwork became infamous because the formaldehyde solution started to leak, right? It started to evaporate out of of this of this structure. So it wasn't well made enough. And he wasn't thinking about the, the over time what the formaldehyde would do. And it was actually making visitors sick because it was in the air around it. Um, as well as, you know, thinking about how it affects this poor shark. So the shark doesn't last forever and actually has to be resourced, which I, I really do hope Damien Hurst uh, sources sustainably his tiger sharks, but I probably probably not. Um, so there is this kind of interesting conversa conversations about pr this problematic health and thinking about animals and humans um, that you can add on to, to, to this work. And then we have earthworks, 
which are in the name, they're generally large scale sculpture that uses the earth itself as, as a sculptural medium. Very, very well known example is Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, which is in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. You can actually visit it. As you can see the scale of the people walking on the salt. And so how is he using the earth as a, a sculpt, as a sculptural medium in and of itself? Well, he actually, you know, the Great Salt Lake, it's very salty and salt is a crystal and it will form on and it will grow. And so he made this spiral out of, of bedrock and dirt and different ty types of rock with the hopes that uh, the the actual salt will start to grow on it and then you will start to see that spiral from from above which you can see has is happening so it, so he's using the actual mechanism of rock formation and crystal formation to to create a, a sculpture and this very abstract swirl which um, is 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 a very is very representative of water itself. Even ancient color, cult, cultures use the swirl as a, as to show water and, and spiraling, but also kind of mimics uh, the type of of sculpture. Uh, I mean, of crystal formation that he's really thinking about. As here's a really great example too of um, the of uh, how how Smithson's work and using the 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 earth as a sculptural medium has has a tie to more ancient prehistoric cultures and um, my, my I like and I said with water but also here with, with Great Serpent Mound which is a very famous prehistoric site an indigenous site in uh, southern Ohio and it's you know I'm from Ohio. So, and I, I remember going to Serpent Mound. It was a very popular destination for, for elementary schoolers to learn about Ohio history and indigenous peoples who lived there. And so this is Serpent Mound, it's a burial mound, and it's in the form of a snake, a serpent, and look at the tails in this wonderful spiral. It's just, just to show you that, um, you know, using earth, the earth as a sculptural medium is an ancient technique that, you know, both indigenous peoples, and here we have Smithson in 1970 doing the same thing. And so this is going to be our last uh, uh, type of sculpture, and then I'll leave you for this episode. And this is this is an interesting one that you can actually even use light and um, kinetic energy itself as sculpture. Sometimes we usually think of sculpture as things that are solid, right? That things that we can, you know, we can pick up or touch, right? But if we're thinking about the three dimensional and that something you experience in three, 360 degrees, you experience light that way. You experience things that you don't necessarily see the structure, but they are there. There's particles in the air. There's there's different mechanisms, right? There's there's lights that are that are built into the walls that are shining a light onto us, right? There's actual construction around us, and so kinetic and light sculpture is a sculpture that consists mainly consists mainly of motion and or light using physical space and technology to create its effects. And a very famous uh, example is James Terrell, who well known as this light sculptor. And he he goes he, he goes into spaces sometimes spaces, spaces like this this is a winery right so a lot he's very popular um, in contemporary spaces as you can probably see it, it, the light really bounces off of these very minimal uh, um, design. And so this isn't a winery, a kind of main gathering space, and he's really using the different light. Um, the colors of light and, and and how it's bouncing off the different aspects of the the actual de architectural design of the room and he's creating these really moody sensations um, you can probably imagine being in the space and f what you would feel sitting on one of these benches and um, yeah and and, and and that's what he does and he he's very commercially successful if any of you remember, uh, Drake's hotline bling video from it's now it's been quite a few years ago, but in that video, um, the, 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 a James Terrell is actually depicted. So you you, know, you can see how the, his light environments are affecting you know say Drake's the color of his his clothing you know the, the, and the different and the movements right um, through through this space. So that's all for uh, three-dimensional art. I will see you back for the next episode.